Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar and spotlight on the Tigray region of Ethiopia, the new and urgent response, organized by Lord Alton of Liverpool and the Coalition for Genocide Response. We have a stellar panel of experts this afternoon and I would like to introduce them shortly. Um, however, now without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Lord Alton of Liverpool, crossbench peer and patron of the Coalition for Genocide Response. Lord Alton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Ochab. It's a pleasure to be with you. And also, can I join with you in thanking all of the participants who are going to be speaking to us uh, during the course um, of uh, th this uh, webinar? It's been quite disproportionate to see how little attention has been focused both in Parliament, but also in the wider world, in the media and elsewhere, about this man-made famine in Tigray, which has come out of the violence and has left 4 million people without enough to eat. It's displaced hundreds of thousands of refugees, joining the 70 million people displaced or who are refugees worldwide. And it's led, of course, to massacres and atrocity crimes, including the use of artillery in attacks on refugee camps. Last November, I first raised in a private notice question the consequences of a decision to unleash the armed forces of Ethiopia in Tigray and the subsequent involvement, of course, of Eritrea in fermenting violence, which has resulted in these war crimes, crimes against humanity and potentially genocide. I asked what assessment the government had made of the report and the conclusions uh, it had drawn uh, under the, it, the, its obligations in the Genocide Convention uh, to look for early warning signs of genocide following the publication of a, of a report as long ago as November about the war crimes that it was alleged were taking place. And of course, under that 1948 convention, the government as a duty bearer has the duty to prevent, to protect, and to punish the perpetrators. So this isn't a faraway place about which we know very little. This is something that we have some responsibility for, and not least as a permanent member of the Security Council. During the correspondence that then ensued with the government, I specifically cited the International Court of Justice judgment in 2007 in the case of Bosnia, and asked, how the government was planning to fulfill that duty to prevent as set out in the judgment. Then in a letter on March the 4th, I wrote again and said, along with oral and written questions, I have sent nearly 30 emails since last November warning of the unfolding atrocities in Tigray. And I quoted in that recent letter, Michel Bachelet, who said that persistent credible reports of grave violations in Tigray underscored the urgent need for human rights access. That's in addition, of course, to the need for humanitarian access. Under the Convention of the Crime of Genocide, we are treaty bound to prevent and protect crimes of genocide, but we also have a duty to collect accounts from fleeing refugees documenting war crimes and crimes against humanity, for which I've repeatedly asked. The UK will increasingly be accused of being derelict in its duties under the Genocide Convention. And I've said that in terms, both in, on the floor of the House, but in correspondence with the Foreign Office as well. On March the 9th, I secured a further oral question in Parliament and asked the government how it had responded to reports of a massacre at Axum in Tigray. Not just a taking of innocent life, but also a deliberate attack on the very identity of Orthodox believers in their mother church, and which Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, from whom we'll hear during this webinar, say may amount to crimes against humanity. Once again, in my question, but also again in correspondence, I wanted to know what we were doing to protect, to prevent, to punish those duties laid upon us in the 1948 Convention. And I pointed out our failure to call out China and Russia in the Security Council the week before last, after they threatened to use a veto against Ireland's attempts, Ireland is currently a permanent member of the Security Council with the United Kingdom, uh, the elected member for, for the course of this 12 months, uh, and Ireland had attempted to raise the issue in the Security Council. I also called for an immediate withdrawal of Eritrean troops from Tigray. Surely that is the prerequisite to ending the depredations in Tigray. I agree with the US Secretary of State 
Antony Blinken, who said last week that, and I quote, the immediate withdrawal of Eritrean forces and Amaro regional forces from Tigray are essential first steps. They should be accompanied by unilateral declarations of cessation of hostilities by all parties to the conflict and a commitment to permit unhindered delivery of humanitarian aid. I hope that this afternoon will shine a light on these massively unreported events and suggest ways of rousing the conscience of an international community which thus far has largely chosen to look the other way and has been missing in action. Thank you very much, Lord Alton. And now we'll begin with the expert panel. Each speaker has up to five minutes and we'll start with Letitia Bader from Human Rights Watch. Letitia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, I mean, maybe to start off with, I mean, it was obviously from the beginning a very difficult context to conduct um, investigations into human rights abuses in, both because of the communication shutdown, which continues to have an impact on our ability to collect information in real time. Um, but at the same time, also the, the shutdown of services has had an impact on communities' ability to also document what has been happening to them. But despite this, um, we have have um, traveled to Sudan to speak to refugees who were fleeing directly as a result of the human rights abuses. And we've begun to put together a picture of the scale and the magnitude and the gravity of the abuses which have been happening since November. So starting with an initial report in which we documented um, apparently indiscriminate shelling during the November offensive by Ethiopian government forces on urban areas. So looking at a series of towns in which we documented similar trends where civilian infrastructure was targeted, in which civilian casualties, so civilians were killed, injured, but this also had an impact and, and led to widespread displacement of the civilian population. And actually, a lot of people we've been speaking to have been repeatedly displaced also by the shelling. And I think when um, my colleague from Amnesty will speak to the issues in Aksum as well, some of our findings there mirror again the, this concern around unlawful shelling in, in, in the initial offensive by Ethiopian and in the case of um, Aksum Eritrean forces as well. Um, then in terms of other trends, I mean, both in Western Tigray, but I think again, the importance of documenting the events in Aksum, which was in many ways, 10 days of horror meted on the population there, is the trends we've been seeing involving different actors throughout the region. Um, and that's again, as I mentioned, unlawful shelling, but then in the immediate aftermath of towns coming under control of the Ethiopian government and their allies in Western Tigray, in this case, we were speaking about the Amhara regional forces and also militia from the Am Hara region, we documented cases of extrajudicial executions, but also widespread looting. The question of looting and, I, and, and also pillaging of key basic infrastructure has been something we've been documenting and continue to document throughout the region. As, as we know, in the last few days, um, MSF have put out a report documenting what they see as a deliberate attack on health care facilities. We have found this in many places where we've been conducting research, once again in Aksum. The week before the massacre, which Amnesty will be speaking about, took place, we saw widespread looting of the two main hospitals. We also saw Eritrean forces coming inside the hospitals and killing patients inside. So really an attack on, on, on these basic services. And as you can imagine, this also obviously has an impact on a community's ability to respond when there are war related injuries affecting the community as well. So these are trends we have documented in the West, but also in areas under Eritrean um, involvement and, and, and occupation as well. Maybe just to briefly touch on some of the research we've been doing, looking at events in two of the Eritrean refugee camps where we have documented both Eritrean forces, but also Tigrayan militia occupation of these camps. 
um, Eritrean refugee population being completely cut off from any humanitarian assistance for two months, living off basically leaves inside the camps, being caught very much between a rock and a hard place between the warring parties in, in those two camps in particular, and then basically being told by the Eritrean forces to leave the camps. Um, so I think both given the scale, the magnitude, the gravity, but the complexity of the crimes we are talking about, we have been calling for an independent international investigation. And I think coming to the discussion here about what the international community needs to be doing, but also what the Ethiopian government needs to be responding to are those calls for an immediate independent international investigation and giving them access to the Tigray region as soon as possible also to preserve critical evidence. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Leticia. And now I would like to give the floor to Fisa Hetekel from Amnesty International. Thanks for this uh, opportunity to uh, brief you about uh, our findings from uh, Aksum. Uh, and also I would like to uh, appreciate uh, the presentation by uh, Leticia about the general situation in, in Tigray. Uh, but I would like to start with um, a background or not about the way the war is being conducted uh, in Tigray. Uh, well, it's a hostility, it's a war, uh, but it's also a war of information. Uh, what's happening in Tigray since the beginning uh, of the conflict in November is uh, a war of information in different formats. One is, uh, well, the obvious one, there was no internet and phone communication since the start of the, uh, the conflict. Uh, where there are many, so many reasons given, but uh, uh, what we know actually is that the phone communication is rarely available in many places uh, and internet communication is almost uh, non-existent except parts of Tigray in the, the western part of Tigray which is now under the control of the Amara region. Uh, physical access, there was no physical access including for human uh, humanitarians and human rights organization. There are few media uh, uh, who were able to go there except some who were able to access the crime. Uh, uh, and even if there was some uh, permission for some of the foreign media to travel and report from them, it was followed by arrest, uh, arrest of transmitters and fixes and local partners. Uh, in addition to that, the government has established a government uh, fact-checking social media handles on Twitter and Facebook uh, by way of controlling the narrative in the country uh, about the conflict. So that has made uh, human rights work very difficult and our job also. That's why uh, we were forced to go to uh, Sudan uh, uh, and to do our investigation from the refugees and by phone. So for our uh, research on the Aksum uh, massacre, we spoke to about 41 people, uh, half of them from Sudan side, refugees, uh, and the other half from uh, Aksum by by, by uh, calling them from their phones or if they are traveling, if they are in Addis or if, if they are in Magali. Uh, so this uh, research was also supported by other methodologies, additional methodologies, including uh, <coughs> uh, satellite imageries and uh, uh, also analysis of some uh, video uh, through our crisis evidence lab. So our, our findings indicate that uh, in addition to what uh, indiscriminate shelling has caused on uh, 19th and 20th of November in the city, there have been a series of uh, extrajudicial executions, mainly by the Eritrean forces in the town of Aksu. Uh, so that started immediately after capturing the town. Uh, and during the next days, they were killing people just because they were suspected of being members of TPLF or supporters of TPLF. Uh, but the climax of that extrajudicial killing, where we have seen, where we believe that more uh, hundreds were killed, happened on 28th and 29th. And on the date of 28th, there was uh, a shootout between the TPLF and militia men and the, Tigra, the Eritrea uh, forces who were based in the, in the center of the city in, uh, in a hill called uh, <coughs> Maikuho. Uh, 
And after that shootout, what happened was that the Eritrean forces uh, started uh, killing people uh, they found on the street, anyone. Uh, and after that, they went home to work using raids and they were targeting the male population. Uh, so um, many parts of the cities, Axum cities, but starting from the Axum Zion church uh, were affected. And the, on top of the extrajudicial executions that targeted the male population, the youth and the, the adults, uh, the, the, there was uh, widespread looting and they didn't allow the dead uh, to be buried. And they were only allowed to bury their dead on 30 of November, which is uh, the annual anniversary of the St. Mariam uh, uh, Church in Aksu. Uh, so, uh, so given the magnitude and the, the, the uh, systemic nature of uh, the killing, uh, Amnesty believes that the extrajudicial execution in Aksum may amount to crimes against humanity. Uh, so that's why we are asking that uh, there has to be a UN-led investigation because what we were able to uh, document and report in Aksum is just a drop in the ocean. We are still getting a number of allegations, credible allegations, and videos are coming out about uh, mass executions uh, of uh, civilians in different parts of the crime. Uh, so given this widespread and multitude of uh, uh, allegations of human rights violations, we are, uh, we are asking for uh, the UK and other partner countries uh, to push for UN-led investigation, uh, which might have different modalities, including joint calls with joint investigation with the African Commission. Uh, but what is asked is that there, the, uh, the exact magnitude of the human rights violation in the context of the Tigray conflict can only come out with an international independent investigation. Thank you. I will leave it. Thank you very much. And, and now I would like to give the floor to Alex Deval uh, from the World Peace Foundation. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for organizing this important and, and, and timely event. Let me make five points. The first goes back to Raphael Lemkin, the Polish lawyer who termed the, the work, who coined the term genocide. And if you read his book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, you will find that he spends more time talking about the use of starvation as an instrument of genocide than he does about gas chambers and death squads. And yet the Nazi hunger plan, the plan to exterminate through starvation some 30 million people on the Eastern Front is really a footnote to history. The use of starvation as an instrument of extermination and genocide is not recognized for what it is in history, and I, I'm fit, and I fear that we are seeing that again today. A second point is that we have developed many sophisticated metrics for measuring food security and humanitarian crisis, but those all operate on assumptions of normality, as it were. In a situation where there is intense armed conflict, and especially where starvation crimes are being committed, where starvation is being used as a weapon of war, where there is comprehensive looting, destruction of objects indispensable to survival, these methods and, me me methods and metrics break down. And what we have seen in Tigray over the last few months is that at every step, the worst case assumptions turn out to be well-founded. The worst case scenarios are unfolding under this blanket of, uh, of denial of access and denial of, 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 of facts. A third point, which I think um, will emerge as important in the coming months, but hasn't yet, I think, been recognized, is that we tend to focus on food security in agriculture and, 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 and what is grown by farmers. Tigray is a historically chronically food deficit region. 
you do not need to destroy crops in Tigray to create famine. You, what you, you can create famine by denying people access to other sources of income because they require they depend on migrant labor, they depend on, on income from services, from industry, etc. And the comprehensive looting and destruction of um, uh, Tigray's industries, its service, its services, the, the dispossession, the takeover of the sesame plantations and farms in Western Tigray, those alone are enough to cause starvation. And in the longer term, we need to ask ourselves, what is the intent of those who are, who, who are perpetrating these crimes in a widespread and systematic way? A fourth point, when it comes to justice, and there will be calls for justice, there will, I hope, be calls for prosecution for those who, 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 who have perpetrated starvation crimes in Tigray. There will also be calls for restitution and reparation. And all the evidence that we have points to the state of Eritrea being responsible for the great majority of those crimes, or the majority of those crimes, I don't want to quantify, but a very substantial proportion of them. And there are obligations of an occupying power under the Hague Convention, under the Geneva Conventions, under customary international law that the lawyers can speak to. And one of the issues that will arise will be the responsibility of the state of Eritrea for reparations and reconstruction of, of, of Tigray. And I hope this is kept on the agenda. And my final point is that um, I have been outspoken on this issue. And I have received many challenges and much abuse from uh, friends, colleagues, and many other Ethiopians. And I want to appeal to them. I want to make a point that um, back in the 1980s, a generation of Ethiopians became associated with images of starving, humiliated people. It took a whole generation of internal peace and economic development for Ethiopia no longer to be associated with those humiliating images. Please do not allow yourselves to be associated with the current images of mass atrocity being perpetrated by Ethiopians and by Eritreans at the invitation of Ethiopia. And above all, do not be, allow yourself to be associated with the denials of this. I speak to people in the Ethiopian government. They privately tell me everything you say is true. Do not be blinded. Do not be used by the propaganda machine of those who know what is happening, who tell me everything you say is true. So please distance yourself, dissociate yourself from those lies and those denials. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And now I would like to give the floor to Martin Plout from the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Lord Alton, for arranging this. Um, I was a journalist with the BBC for nearly 30 years. And I must say, this is one of the saddest wars I've ever had to cover. Uh, because partly, Journalists like myself, uh, my colleagues, would not be able to do their job. They cannot get to where they need to report from. They cannot uh, get the first-hand testimony that is required. And even the translators that they've been working with inside Tigray have been picked up, roughed up, uh, beaten up, and uh, arrested. And that, that means that they then are even more frightened to give the testimony that, is, that they need to. But it is beginning to come out. And in the last hour, we have had from the Agence France Press a statement, which is a recording of a um, statement made by General Johannes Gebremeskel Tesfa Mariam, head of a task force formed in response to the Tigray conflict. And in it, he says this, this is a dirty war because it is affecting everybody. You don't see fronts, the cost is immediately to those who are defenseless. He said this on the 11th of March at a briefing in the regional capital, Michele, attended by dozens of diplomats. Frankly, if Agence France Press knows it, so does the British government, because I assume 
uh, unless somebody tells me otherwise, that the, 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 uh, the British government was represented at that uh, briefing. I think that the one thing that is absolutely crystal clear about this war is that by far and away, the worst price is being paid by women. Um, colleagues of mine have estimated that something like 10,000 women have been raped um, in this war. And some of the testimonies are beyond description. Um, there is one, uh, I think, accurate description, which talks of a grandfather shot because he refuses to have, have indulge in incest with his granddaughter. Her she was then shot as well. There is video going around, which I'm sure that um, some of you on this call have seen, which shows um, a woman having stones and nails removed from her genitals. Uh, this is after multiple rape. This is what is going on right now. I mean, it is beyond description, is beyond uh, anything that I can imagine. There's another, uh, uh, another example is of people standing by a cliff, soldiers shooting people, sometimes only wounding them and then kicking them over the cliff. This is what is taking place. And I think when we, when we, when we are trying to understand this, the by far and away the worst excesses are being undertaken by the Eritreans. Um, and in order to understand that, you have to understand what has happened uh, since 1991, when uh, Eritrea achieved its independence after a 30-year war at great jubilation, is that they have lived in the most brutal state. Um, and the children and the young people who have gone into the military are utterly brutalized. They have been indoctrinated that the Tigrayans are their personal enemies and are standing between them and all that is good. And they are capable of almost anything. They, they have no parameters any longer. Um, and you know, they are, even though they are carrying out these atrocities, in a sense, they are victims as much as anybody else because they have been utterly brutalized. And the Eritrean responsibility for this is extraordinary. And I'm afraid President Isaias should really be in front of the International Criminal Court. And it should be the United Kingdom that takes him before that court. The UK, as a permanent member, has the right to refer matters to the International Criminal Court. And that is what should happen now, because Eritrea cannot be allowed to get away. And how Ethiopian generals are allowing these things to go on their soil, that they are bound to defend, that they are sworn to defend, they are allowing invaders to inflict these atrocities on men and women that they believe are their country uh, people is appalling. And uh, you know, I just hope that people like uh, General Lehanus will continue to speak out and will continue to be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. And now I would like to give the floor to Professor Jan Nissen from Ghent University. Professor Jan, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, I am now professor in Ghent University, but I've been carrying out research in Tigray since 1994 and going there every year and more several times per year, living there years in, in succession. So I know a lot of people over there. And when this war came, this was really catastrophic. People were talking about it before you sensed that it was coming, but we didn't expect this thing. Anyway, when the war came, we launched initiatives by academics in order to, and we started talking about famine that will be coming. And just like Alex was, uh, was mentioning, at that time, we didn't anticipate everything that was going to happen in addition. Just closing banks. You would say, what, what about closing banks? But it means that people cannot access their money. Um, and then we have been following the news without any access. And somewhere, somewhere end of December, it became possible to telephone to, to McKinney. And then it was like a big, a big shock. Because when we telephoned in the beginning, people didn't want to talk. Or even my best friends, they would say, but Mr. John, they call me Mr. John, you know it all. No, we don't know it. We don't know anything. And then we have to talk several days and then people became more freely and talking about all the horrors that have, that have happened. And these are endless histories of extrajudicial killings, soldiers going into villages and, uh, and uh, shooting people. I have a small house in, 
in a small town in, in Tigray, not too far from uh, from Mekele. And then they came with apologies. Mr. John, your house has been looted. Everything has been stolen. Oh, this is a small thing as compared. Everything has been stolen. That is up to the plastic basins and my socks. Huh? It is really looting everything. And they continue looting. Now it goes that far that the soldiers are sitting in camps along the road. The people are not allowed to leave their village because they are using them as human shields. If you have seven chicken, you will bring seven eggs every morning to the soldiers. And you don't have food for yourself. Huh? So it goes, it goes that far. We have documented all this, this information. And we have just published an atlas of the humanitarian situation of Tigray. I just Google Atlas of the Humanitarian Situation of Tigray. We have about 20 maps that present the whole humanitarian situation. We cannot give you every detail about IDPs and about the starvation and so on. But we have started to map the civilian casualties. And we have mapped the civilian casualties that are known by name, who has killed, when, in which place it was killed. And so far, we have the map has been updated just today, and we have 1,622 people that we know with every detail. From these people, and it is true, of course, that the women are very much targeted, but from the civilian casualties, we have 90% of men. Uh, in the, in the extrajudicial killings, in the massacres, the men, and especially the younger men, they are targeted because potential, potential uh, enemies. We are tallying, we are recording the massacres. We have today 94 massacres in Tigray. When we say a massacre, it means five people in one location within one day that have been killed. That's a definition that comes to us from the Armenian genocide. It's a bit like Alex says, people automatically think about the Nazi genocide, but there are other examples of genocide if we want to compare. And maybe the Armenian genocide could be something that fits more with what we are seeing in, in Tigray. Um, so far, the civilian casualties that we have really tallied, they are 7,138. This means in this village, this much people on this day. There are many more. And then the starvation is not counted at all. We see now people coming out. People have been hiding in the bush. People have been hiding in caves. People have been hiding in gorges. People don't hide anymore in the church because the church is a target. Uh, and people are coming out totally emaciated. They are starving from, from hunger. And the worst is still to come. After two months, the plowing season starts. There is, there is no grain. The farmers have eaten, are eating that grain that they need, that they need to sow. Uh, there is no fertilizer. Farmers have learned to work with fertilizer. The, in every town, systematically, agricultural office is destroyed. Water office is destroyed. This is totally disrupting the society. And we are going to go for a big failure in the harvest in Tigray in the, uh, in the next year. I can continue talking about all these horrors that are happening, but I think we have some politicians with us and we are really counting on them. I'm not a politician at all, but I count on them for hammering those who are committing all these war crimes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to give the floor to Archbishop Angelos, Coptic Orthodox Archbishop of London. Saidna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evelina, and thank you, Lord Alton, for this opportunity. First and foremost, um, I come to you as a church leader, as a bishop in the Coptic Orthodox Church, which is a sister church to our wonderful, uh, beloved Ethiopian Tuahido Orthodox Church. And um, I must assure you, this is not political, it is not partisan. Uh, Ethiopians are passionate about their country. Anyone who knows me knows that daily I carry an Ethiopian blessing cross. This is what I carry on a day-to-day -day basis because of the love for that culture and the recognition of the relationship with the church. But uh, my plea is that we don't get caught up in, in the rhetoric, in attacks and defensiveness, and in a love that makes us blind to reality. Um, someone in, in the question said this was a secret meeting. This is by no means a secret meeting. This was advertised on social media and people were invited to it openly. Um, but it is splitting people and communities who love their church and love their country and love their, their culture. The reality is that we see people suffering. The reality is that 
uh, this comes from a variety of sources. And the reality is that relatives in the West outside of Ethiopia are unable to reach their families and loved ones. And so um, there are uh, limited means of availability to make sure that they're okay. The statistics I'm sure everyone on the call is familiar with, the population of about 7 million um, in, in the Tigray region, um, a vast majority it would be members of the Ethiop Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Um, I've spoken to, to numerous people who have said, and these statistics I have, 22 churches have been damaged, 41 churches have been burned to the ground, um, several priests and deacons have been accused of, um, of being affiliated with uh, attacking forces, and so they have uh, been taken and sometimes killed. Uh, other priests and deacons have fled into the jungles to find uh, safety there and into the uh, caves. Um, as we've heard, uh, a, a huge, a huge uh, part of the burden falls on women and girls with a lot of, uh, of reports of, of rape as a means of war. Um, nuns reported to have been raped and also uh, a, a large number of, of teens have been killed or, or taken from their families. Now this is in one of the most sacred regions of Ethiopia, a region that is beloved by all. Um, and that, of course, leads us then to the tens of thousands reported to have been internally and externally displaced, uh, feeding into the already incredible number of, of refugees in our world today. We need to look at the allegations. Um, the reality is that we are seeing reports that someone needs to answer to. Now, I, I personally, I hope that the reports are being fabricated. I hope that the facts are being fabricated. I hope that the horrific videos we've all seen have been fabricated. No one wants that more. But my plea is that we put aside notions of defensiveness and look at people who are suffering. They are people who have been alienated and marginalized. And we are only too aware that when we leave these things to develop and increase incrementally, it turns into something that becomes systemic. Of course, as we've just heard as well, places of worship, especially in a country like Ethiopia, so built on its religious foundation, have been safe havens for so long. But they are now the places that people flee from because they have become targets with such an incredible wealth and culture in the cave churches that we see, in the faithful, in the mountain monasteries. Even for those who don't really care about religion, these places are national gems. But for the people who are founded in their faith, these people are safe havens and part of their own being. And of course, as we said, they are places of refuge. So what we're seeing is heartbreaking. I can only imagine what families around the world are feeling when they see these pictures. And as I said, if they are fabricated, if they are false, please let us know. But if they're not, uh, silence is in itself an acceptance of what is happening, which is entirely unacceptable in our world today. Our world is, already suffering in pain of a pandemic. And we know that marginalized and persecuted communities have a disproportionate burden of this falling on them already. So at a time when we should be supporting communities that are struggling, it is heartbreaking to see those communities suffering. So I pray that out of this, we can look at what is happening, get down to the reality and if there is a problem, solve it for everyone who loves that nation, loves that church, and loves the incredible heritage and the gifts that it brings to us. Thank you, Athena. Thank you very much, Sayedna.
And, and as Saidna mentioned, we must put political agendas aside and look at the suffering of, of, of the people in the region and we must put victims first, that's the most important. And for the next section of the webinar, we have three members of the UK House of Lords um, who make some comments in relation to what they've had uh, today. And we have Bernard Stroker, Conservative peer and former Minister of State for Overseas Development in Africa, Lord Botong, Labour peer and former Cabinet Minister and High Commissioner to South Africa, and we have Lord Alton that I introduced already. And I would like to give the floor to Bernard Stroker. Thank you very much. I am very conscious that I am learning every day new horrors about what is going on in Tigray. I certainly know from what has been said by our excellent contributors that this needs to be more widely known. I think uh, David Alton will agree with me, it is not uh, so widely known. I'm very puzzled uh, about the comment, I think it was Martin who made it, uh, about the Agence France Press on the 11th of March and this uh, would be known by the Foreign Office, and that is something that David and I can follow up in the House of Lords. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to know, and having been through some of the tragedies before in Ethiopia, but what is bedeviling this particular tragedy is that Eritrea is as involved as the rebels in Tigray, in perpetuating the troubles. I am very conscious that there has been conflicting information and I find that UNDP do not seem to be on the ball at all. I do believe that uh, UNHCR, are, Mark, uh, Mark Lowcock knows what's going on and I'm seeking to have greater contact with him to see how we can best get not only the Security Council, but the officials in all the UNDP and other UN organizations to wake up to what is actually going on in Tigray. I don't know whether those who've spoken have uh, more that they can say on this, but it is tragic that we're seeing a repeat of what went on in those bad old years in the eighties. ISAF Waki in Eritrea does not listen to those in the African Union at all, I'm told. I don't sit obviously in the African Union, but I'm told he is deaf to the comments. And Ethiopia will always be one of the saddest wars going on uh, in Africa at any time. But I don't yet believe that the UN has done sufficient to call to order Ethiopians of all sorts, and indeed also Eritrea. And I think we have to press the UN as well as national governments to do much more to wake up to what is going on. I have offered to help David Alton as much as I can. And I know there are others who want more briefing within the House of Lords, and we will see what can be done to get some of the information that you've shared with us this afternoon out to a much wider group of people. But it has to be um, the AU and the UN who really start to pressurize both the Ethiopian government and the leaders of all the rebels if one can reach them. I may think of other things that I wanted to say a little later, but I'm very conscious that I'm there to help David on a uh, all party basis, and I will do my best to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to give the floor to Lord Button. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Acha. Uh, yes, I am uh, a British uh, politician, former cabinet minister and high commissioner, um, and indeed a lawyer for that matter. But you know, I uh, approach this issue first and foremost as someone who is an African. I was brought up in Africa, brought up in Africa during uh, the 50s and 60s, 
uh, and for me, I relate to Ethiopia uh, and indeed Eritrea as an African. To a certain extent, all of us who are Africans are Ethiopians. Uh, the great uh, civil rights uh, leader and Pan-Africanist Marcus Garvey used to call upon the world uh, to uh, look uh, uh, at itself through the eyes of Ethiopia, through uh, as African people. The capital of Africa is Addis Ababa in terms of the Africa Union. And therefore anything that damages Ethiopia and Ethiopians damages Africa. And ultimately this terrible crisis and this horrific fratricide, sororicide that is, that is going on in which brother is killing brother, sister, brother, cousins are all killing each other, it has to stop um, because it is self-destructive in every sense of that word. It threatens the huge strides that Ethiopia has made politically in terms of its development. It threatens to destabilize the whole of the Horn of Africa because of the role, the constructive role that Ethiopia has played in seeking to resolve uh, problems in uh, Somalia, Somaliland, uh, the, the Sudan. The critically st important strategic position uh, of uh, Ethiopia in terms of its relationship uh, through the Nile uh, with uh, Egypt. Uh, all of this is threatened uh, by this civil war and by this horrific humanitarian crisis about which, yes, we do need to know more, but we know enough to know that horrible atrocities are being committed. We know enough to know uh, that Eritrea, I fear, and Eritrean armed forces are behind much of them. We must call upon them, the international community, the Africa Union, the United Nations must call upon Eritrea to withdraw. That is a precondition. And you know, I speak as someone who, you know, used to go to Addis to talk to a man who I regard, regarded as a friend at whose funeral meeting in London I spoke, Prime Minister Melesh, urging him uh, to respect uh, the territorial aspirations uh, of uh, Eritrea. You know, I chair a charity that has worked in and for Eritrea and Eritreans. So I don't speak as an enemy of Eritrea. I speak as a friend of Eritrea and Ethiopia and say, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. But I don't believe it will stop simply by actions taken in London in Paris or in New York or in Moscow or Beijing, because what we cannot have again is Ethiopia and Eritrea being torn apart in some sort of second round geopolitical conflict between different powers, all of whom are seemingly paralyzing each other in terms of the engagement of the Security Council. Because there is a real worry about how the UN is or is not responding to this crisis. And it does reflect a, a political paralysis on the Security Council with Russia, China, the United States, uh, the UK, all seem to have their own agendas, whether they do or not. I don't think we should play geopolitics with this. The concern must be humanitarian. And the concern has to be to get the information out there, to permit uh, international observers to enter uh, Tigray, to lift the communications uh, blackout. But it seems to me, listening to all concerned, uh, that the way forward does lie. Not, I have to say, in it's, uh, I hear what's, I'm a lawyer, I hear what's said about the International Court. The International Court isn't going to solve this issue any more than it could have solved or did solve the horrors of apartheid South Africa. You know, if you told uh, the apartheid regime that were going to be dragged before the international court. Does anyone seriously believe there would have been a resolution of that conflict? So I don't think that helps, frankly.
what we have to do is to support a political solution. There has to be a broadly based inclusive dialogue about the way forward for the many constituencies that exist in that part of, of Africa. Respect uh, for minorities, respect um, the development of some broad consensus to access power and resources, to permit a degree of political contestation. And for that dialogue to be credible, there has to be a recognition on the part of the government in Addis, on the part uh, of uh, those who are in Tigray, on the part of the Eritreans, that there has to be an inclusive dialogue. And it is the role of the West to support that in terms of its resources. And to say, you know, the British taxpayer, and I, and I was an MP, uh, as were all of us on this panel, we are accountable to the, tax, to the taxpayer and the taxpayers are paying money to Ethiopia, paying money into the UN and to, and to Eritrea. So we do expect to be heard not to have the decisive voice. The decisive voice belongs to the people in the region. The decisive voice belongs ultimately to uh, those people and of course supported by the Africa Union and we have to support uh, the Africa Union. But there has to be some sort of political initiative. And it seems to me that the AU and the UN with, with peoples in Tigray and in Addis and in Eritrea, uh, they need to come around the table and to and to sort this out because because Ethiopia is a precious place. It is an incredibly beautiful, great place. It is the only place on earth where if our Lord were to come down today and to stand in the street, he could understand what the people are saying because the language is so pure, so directly descended from his time. The Abrahamic religions, Jews, Muslims, Christians have lived side by side peacefully in Ethiopia for centuries. They, Ethiopia potentially is an example to the whole world. So we cannot stand by while it tears itself apart. We cannot delight once again to be a place where there's a contestation between East and West, between different competing political systems. All that matters is the humanitarian crisis. All that matters is that Ethiopia needs to be Africa's best hope. And that's where I'm coming from. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to Lord Olson. Thank you, Dr. Rechab. You can see why I was so keen that Lord Botang and Baroness Chalker should join our wonderful team of experts that we've had speaking on the webinar today. But this combination of wisdom and passion, uh, I, I think has given us a, a wonderful culmination to the webinar. Uh, Baroness Chalker said that it's insufficiently widely known what's happening in Tigray. And Lord Botang said, but we know enough to act. I, I was thinking as he spoke, if the United Kingdom wanted to make a positive contribution, they might ask my two colleagues, uh, to lead a peace mission to the region, to see if they could bring people together to try and find some resolution to these issues. As colleagues have said, all speakers have said, our motives in being involved in this issue is a humanitarian motive. It's because of a love of the people of both Ethiopia and Eritrea. It's not because of a hatred or a taking of sides. It's because we have been reading the reports that have been coming out and we have felt that insufficient is being done in order to protect the people on the ground. Uh, as one speaker said earlier on, that we think back to those images from the Ethiopian famine and the, the definition of Ethiopia in people's imaginations during the 1980s because of the famine. But there was also a worldwide response through Band Aid, Live Aid, where there was an outpouring of affection, love and concern, wanting to try and help the country to overcome that, that famine not a man-made famine as this one is, but to overcome that famine and to find a way forward. Interestingly, both presidents have in recent years tried to make some interesting innovative moves towards reconciliation between Ethiopia and Eritrea, which after all had been in a state of hostility for the previous two decades. 
and both of them have been given the Nobel Peace Prize. Now is the time for them to put that to good use. The only other thing I want to say, because I set the scene at the beginning of our remarks, is to remind people about what it is that we do know. And, you know, from representative organizations, but also from the media, and despite not being able to get full access, many of these reports are based on first-hand accounts from survivors and from refugees who have been escaping from the region. Take, for instance, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission report on Mike Adre. And I notice in the chat that someone has been asking specifically why that hasn't been referred to. In fact, that massacre took place on the 9th of November. I sent the details of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission preliminary report to the Foreign Office. They said the perpetrators killed hundreds of people with full intent. A plan and preparation had been in place. The conduct was committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against a civilian population. And they said that perpetrators targeted civilian residents of my cadre. They profiled based on their ethnic origin. On December the 2nd, in a question that I secured on the floor of the House, I asked what efforts the UK was making to secure access to the region and what it was doing to secure evidence so that these accounts will never be forgotten and that there will be, as uh, Alex Deval said earlier on, the opportunity where there's where starvation has been used as a weapon of war, the, the opportunity to bring about restitution and reparation. I strongly agree with what he said about that. I wrote to the United Nations Security General, Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, with others and pointed out that 100,000 Eritrean refugees in Tigray, most of whom live in, lived in four UN sponsored refugee camps, uh, and many of whom had uh, unaccompanied minors in those camps, that the conditions had deteriorated rapidly. We've seen reports since that at a significant number of those refugees may have been seized at gunpoint from camps like Hitsats, Shimbelva, Shire Town, and either forced onto the front lines of the fighting or forcibly returned to Eritrea in complete contravention of the uh, conventions on the treatment of refugees. Inevitably, sent back to Eritrea, they will face indefinite detention, forced conscription, torture, and other inhuman, cruel, and degrading treatments, or even death. We've got to remind the Ethiopian authorities also about their obligations under the UN Refugee Conventions. At the beginning of February, I drew attention of ministers to the warning of the UN Special Advisor on Genocide, that if urgent measures weren't immediately taken, to address the ongoing challenges facing the country, the risk of atrocity crimes remained high and was likely to get worse. And I sent ministers details of that appalling video uh, mentioned by His Grace, Archbishop <laughs> Angelos and, and others on this call, of the massacre that was circulating and the reported widespread deployment of Eritrean conscripts in Tigray and their involvement in looting, defilement by rape, pillaging and murder in what was named as genocide of the Tigrayan people. The following week, I sent the government details of the Associated Press report of the massacre in Axum. These were their words. Bodies with gunshot wounds lay in the streets for days in Ethiopia's holiest city. At night, residents listened in horror as hyenas fed on the corpses of people they knew, but they were forbidden from burying their dead by the invading Eritrean soldiers. The AP report went on to say the city began to smell of death as some bodies went untouched for days. I saw a horse cart carrying around 20 bodies to the church. The very trained soldiers stopped them and told people to throw them back onto the street. Escaping refugees, I might add, many now in Sudan have described vicious attacks, including systematic use of rape as a weapon of war and even the disembowelment of women. And then on February the 20th, the Daily Telegraph published further shocking evidence and said it had photographs too graphic to publish, showing bodies of children and adolescents literally blown into, into pieces. The UN Special Advisor on Genocide Prevention confirmed that multiple reports have been received of extrajudicial killings, mass executions, sexual violence, looting, and that humanitarian access had been impeded. Failure to act makes all of us culpable in these actions. I wrote on the 28th of February to 
government ministers drawing their attention to a CNN report of another massacre at Dengalat Church, where Eritrean soldiers opened fire on a defenseless congregation. As some fled, the troops followed, spraying the mountainside with bullets. And finally, just on March the 8th, I drew the attention of ministers to a briefing note which had been sent to me by a charity which I know well and which works in Tigray. Their words, brutal fighting has been reported across the region and gross human rights violations against civilians, including forced displacement, massacres, abductions and sexual abuse have been reported. They said as a result of such widespread devastation and upheaval, more than four and a half million people in the region are in urgent need of food aid. Rarely have we witnessed a need so great or heard of such atrocities. We need to be resolute in holding to account those who have unleashed these appalling events. But as Albert Ang has said, the immediate priority is to stop these things from happening. And we should use all of our undoubted resources, our privileges, our freedoms, our liberties, the opportunity to organize events such as this one to shine a light on these terrible events and to ensure that the world starts to act. Thank you very much, Lord Alton. And before we conclude, I would like to give the floor to Maddie Crowther. Hi, uh, my name is Maddie, and I'm a parliamentary researcher and coordinator who is helping to build the UK Parliament's understanding of Eritrea and its role regionally, as well as to promote action to prevent and respond to the atrocity crimes which we've heard about powerfully, uh, and it also seems controversially today. And it's my understanding that the Coalition for Genocide Response shares that aim in making change and not just talking about it. So how can we promote action together? And I mean that whether you're a parliamentarian listening in today or uh, a member of the public in the UK or abroad. So I hope to be in touch with you all as attendees uh, and to share that information over coming days to confirm exactly what actions might be most helpful. But that might be asking your member of parliament to speak to me, especially if they want to champion the search for solutions on these issues. That could be amplifying the efforts and voices of, of Lord Alton, Baroness Chalker and Lord Boateng in the House of Lords. And it could be getting support for parliamentary statements such as early day motions, or of course, through many other methods. Uh, it is a conversation and it's this has just been one conversation. So let's keep it going. There are people who want to hear voices and people ready to listen. So um, I just wanted to come in and say that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madi. And um, I would like to, as, as we conclude, uh, because of course it's already five o'clock, um, I would like to say, say a big thank you to all our speakers for taking the time uh, to, to join us here today and discuss very important issues and covering um, a topic that has not received enough attention, whether the UK Parliament or other international um, venues. And just, just to repeat what was said um, today, we know enough to act. I think we've, we've heard enough about what's been happening um, in Tigray and we, we cannot neglect it. We cannot uh, disregard all the information. If we believe that any of the information is incorrect, this is yet another reason why we need independent investigation into the situation in the Tigray. So we, we should not just disregard the information as incorrect if, if, that, if, if we believe that it is incorrect. We need investigation, and that should be our focus uh, um, um, as we as we continue working on the topic. And I would like to say a big thank you also to all who attended today for all your questions. Unfortunately, we did not have enough time to to answer them, but we'll try to answer some of the questions that were raised earlier today, and we'll be in touch in due course. So thank you very much for for joining us today, and I'll be in touch with with ne next steps and uh, information about next uh, next topics that we will be covering thank you very much <laughs>